this is joint work with uh, Wilma uh, from Columbia GSP. So the first paper is uh, kind of most of what I've discussed today, but we also have some ongoing work uh, that's an, an extension of, of, of this research. Uh, before I get started, I want to say a few words on, on kind of my interests and, and my research agenda. So I'm uh, broadly interested in digital platforms, both from the perspective of optimizing uh, the algorithms and the processes they use, but also increasingly from the perspective of what we can learn from these platforms. And um, I started uh, kind of my journey with an interest in the issue of choice modeling. So platforms have a lot of consumer data. And the way we make sense of that data is using probabilistic choice models that represent distributions of preferences. Um, in the past couple of years, as, as, as uh, uh, Kwong mentioned, I've been interested in also the matching of supply and demand in uncertain and uh, stochastic environments. So uh, basically the algorithm that these platforms use to balance between demand and supply, and that will be, today's work will be, to talk will be a representation of my work in that area. And then um, from an applied perspective, I've been also increasingly interested in the process of digitization, which means actually deploying digital platforms to acquire new data in areas that don't that are not so data friendly. And an example would be the cultural sector. So kind of in a nutshell, my work is at the intersection of algorithms and stochastics. And uh, although my work doesn't fit squarely in, I would say, uh, applied probability, I think stochastics is a uh, useful both as, a, I would say, a model primitive, so how to formulate models of the world, but also um, in anal analyzing algorithms and control algorithms, the emergence uh, of, of properties that guarantee uh, the performance of these algorithms. So today, I'll, I think my work will uh, hopefully speak to, to these aspects, both aspects. So let me jump into the problem of interest, the decision problem. So it's called it online matching, and I'll use order fulfillment as a, an example. So that's a problem that uh, say uh, retail platforms might be facing. Uh, so suppose I have an inventory of, of pumpkins across a network, which means I have different uh, warehouses where I stock inventory. And in the online matching problem, I'll have uh, queries from customers and I'll have to choose um, how to dispatch, uh, how to fulfill those queries. So there's a consumer that comes in um, online, which means that uh, there's a real-time decision to make, but it also means that um, I don't know in advance uh, the demand side of the equation. I, I control the supply side, but I don't control the demand side. And um, I have to choose how to fulfill this consumer query, with which pump, pumpkin to, to ship from which warehouse. And um, so obviously in, in most cases, I, I would be tempted to be myopic, which means I would uh, satisfy the consumer with the closest warehouse because I want to minimize cost or maximize rewards, which is revenue minus cost, I reduce lead time. Uh, but it turns out that this problem is not that easy because um, what I'm interested in is really to maximize the rewards over some planning horizon. And that planning horizon is basically dictated by the next replenishment where I can basically refresh my inventory. And this means that a decision that might seem optimal right now might turn out to be suboptimal depending on what happens next. So if the consumer shows up, as I'm showing here, uh, I'm, I'll be able to satisfy that consumer from the other warehouse. But supposing that I kind of exhaust and deplete my inventory initially, then uh, my initial myopic decision might sound highly suboptimal in hindsight. So I want to compare this sort of online decisions to something that is high, hindsight optimal. And the objective is to maximize the total uh, reward. Uh, so, which means that there's a trade-off here, a uh, fundamental trade-off between maximizing current um, current rewards uh, myopically for the current consumer versus leaving the inventory, you know, in a strategic location to fulfill future demand. And uh, this is a trade-off that has been extensively uh, kind of studied and explored in uh, communities across computer science operations, economics, and stochastics, and and that's really the the, the crux uh, of the problem. So in my work, I've been interested in basically um, various first order considerations um, that shape the stochastic aspects of this problem that are not appearing on this slide. That's, so that is really the current canonical model. Uh, but if you think about services and say matching platforms, really the problem we're thinking about is a queuing problem because my consumers, they come in, but my supply is also something that comes in online. 
this is stochastic process both on the demand and on the supply side. And then both of these agents have some patience. They're waiting, they, they stick in the system for some time and then they abandon. And, and these aspects are kind of overlooked from uh, this picture that I showed you. And that's very important in, um, uh, in, in service platforms. So uh, in the previous work, we've looked at um, how to do online matching when what we're doing is we're controlling a matching queue. Um, another consideration of importance is that, um, fortunately or unfortunately, to be best of my knowledge, pumpkins don't have preferences over humans, although humans have preferences over different forms of pumpkins. So in many markets, thinking again about service markets, uh, the preference, there are preferences on both sides of the market, a stochastic preference on both sides of the market. Um, and that's been another uh, kind of dimension that we've looked at um, how to model these two-sided preferences and what does it mean for uh, the trade-off that I described to you. Um, and, and broadly speaking, you know, what these considerations bring is that we will have to formulate a different model, but it means also that uh, the relaxations, the type of, of tractable relaxations we use to guide good policies and to analyze policies will vary once we introduce these different sources of stochasticity. But in today's talk, I'm, I want to talk about something that is actually even more fundamental when I think about this trade-off between uh, serving myopic, myopically the current consumer versus thinking about uh, the value of my inventory in the future to meet future demand. Which is if I think about this picture, if I think about this trade-off and which of the two matching, so here there are two potential matchings. Um, this obviously depends on the location of future demand. If you think about what is a good policy, it's a good policy in hindsight is a policy that kind of mimics what would be the optimal in hindsight, and this depends on future demand. So as a result, if you think about this trade-off between being myopic versus uh, saving um, demand or so inventory for the future, really this should also depend about on the extent to which I can predict uh, the future demand, the predictability or the uncertainty that there is around future demand. Uh, so the question that, that we started with in this research is how should we model the effects of predictability and uncertainty in online matching decisions? Being and it understood that if there's low predictability, low uncertainty, then in some sense, the problem is easy uh, because I know the future so I can in some sense uh, 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 you know, be comfortable doing uh, intertemporal trade-offs. But if there is a lot of uncertainty, a lot of predictability, uh, uh, then in that case, maybe myopic decisions are, are fine enough because the future is more uncertain. Uh, and it turns out quite surprisingly that even if this question is, is, is quite central to the decision problem, there isn't a lot of uh, stochastic models that allow you to really represent the quantity of uncertainty uh, within the model. So what I'll argue, I'll start a bit of time just showing that there is a, a, an important failure or important limitation in classical models which uh, implies that actually we cannot re easily represent the uncertainty and the quantity of uncertainty more specifically uh, in future demand. And that in some sense, the models are kind of oblivious uh, to this quantity of uncertainty. And then we present uh, a framework, a non call it non-parametric. And uh, I'll, I'll make clear what this means, but essentially it will be quite, gen it will generalize existing models and allow for quantification of uncertainty within the model formulation. And then uh, the main surprise is that despite the generality of this framework, we're actually able to um, develop new matching algorithms that are uh, that achieve optimal performance guarantees, but we will have to rethink the type of relaxations we use to guide our, poli our, our policies. So that's the outline for the talk. Um, and yeah, no questions so far. So I'll, let me start with this classic model. So how do we think about the problem in a, in a classic framework? So as you can imagine, um, one central ingredient is that we have a bipartite graph or two sided to represent the two-sided market. So what this represents is that on one side, there are resources. On the other side, there, there are demand, consumers, or we'll call them queries in this, um, in this talk. And um, the graph will um, essentially, on the left side, you'll have all the inventory. So there's some starting inventory, Ki, for every resource I. Um, which are offline resources, which means that these resources are something I control. So I know them, I know initially how many of them I have. 
um, which in, in many applications uh, would be, if you have a centralized platform, would be a reasonable assumption. And then on the other side of the graph, I will have the consumer demand, and that's the, the crux of the problem, that because the consumers are initially unknown and they will arrive online. So now how do we model these um, uh, online consumers is really where we can find different sorts of models in the literature. And by the way, so we'll have um, matching rewards between, between resources and queries. Um, so we, we assume that there are types of, of consumers and there is a, an associated reward RIJ for matching resource I with uh, query type J. And where our goal will be to maximize rewards. So in terms of, of the arrival process, in the literature, we find ourselves with kind of a, a separation between um, two classes of models that have been extensively studied. So one is, let's assume that uh, uh, we don't know anything about online demand. Um, so we assume some form of adversarial models and these have been popularized by the computer science literature. So unfortunately in this context, um, we cannot achieve any constant factor performance bound, which means that the, the gap of performance between any feasible policy and uh, the optimal hindsight will be unbounded if the rewards are unbounded. So they're the kind of performance bounds we can get are much weaker. And as a result, there's been a lot of work around stochastic models that have stochastic arrival. So we, we're gonna represent in that context uh, the process by which different consumers of different types will arrive um, to, to this market and will request a service or product. Um, and so what I, what I want to emphasize now is that even if this is not explicit in the literature, the underlying assumption that has been uh, guiding a lot of the, the model formulations is that the demand is Poisson-like. It's either Poisson or Poisson-like this demand distribution. And um, as a result, there will be a fundamental limitation for these models to accommodate uh, uncertainty and to decouple the mean signal from the variance or the amount of uncertainty there is in the arrival process. And that's, that's the point I want to argue about. Um, and in some sense, our uh, framework will allow to go beyond this separation of adversarial and stochastic. It will allow us to quantify uncertainty and formulate a quantification of uncertainty. So what is the, the type of models that we encounter in this literature? Um, I think coming from stochastics, you know, something that seems very natural is to say, okay, there's an arrival process. So let's model that arrival process. Let's model how customers come uh, to us uh, in an online fashion uh, as time uh, passes, right? So we have T periods of time, there's, that's the horizon. And in, in every period, uh, suppose I'm using these uh, blue, uh, white and red types of customers, there's gonna be a toss of a coin and that toss of a coin will indicate which type of consumer comes in. So for example, at time T minus one, maybe there's one consumer of red consumer coming in. Uh, and that's and that's the realization of, of, of the randomness at time uh, t minus one. And I can always pick you know my discretization of time fine enough so that there is only I can look at only one customer at a time arriving, right? So that's um, an implicit assumption here. And then I move on to the period t. I'm going to have another pass of a coin, um, and maybe I, I'm going to draw a, a blue customer. So now there's one more blue customer. And then uh, at T plus one, I get another blue customer. So I'm, I'm showing you on the left-hand side how I'm incrementing the demand count for each type of consumers. So theta here represent basically the multinomial distribution for uh, the probabilities of arrivals of different types. And in each uh, uh, period, each slice of time, we, we have a toss coin. And obviously we can assume also that there is no, uh, there's a possibility that no customer shows up. Now, of course, this model can be as general as desired. So there are some assumptions behind these types of models that you know, are present in the literature. But the important assumption I want to highlight is uh, serial independence, that basically uh, conditional on the information available to the decision maker, these tosses of a coin over time are independent, that the type of the consumer that shows up at T minus one and the type that shows up at T, at T plus one, they're uh, independent uh, uh, toss coins. And it, in some sense, if we're looking at time, you know, fine enough, that seems like a reasonable assumption because these are different consumers. So why would they uh, be directly related? But an important implication of this assumption is that now if I'm aggregating over time and I'm looking at uh, the total demand, so if I'm counting how many customers came in, this is a, a negative uh, by, uh, Poisson distribution, binomial distribution. So essentially it's Poisson, 
where uh, the mean is the sum of these data vectors, uh, which is the expected number of customers coming in. Um, and this basically comes from adding up all these uh, independent Bernoulli outcomes. And another assumption is that the variance will be smaller than the mean, and that's something you know that uh, to this audience will, will appear to be like a basic observation around uh, these types of models. Now, it turns out that this stochastic formulation is actually, I would say, um, dominant in the literature. There are very limited work that deviates from this assumption. Um, so there's uh, rich literature on uh, that basically is uh, building on the serial uh, independence assumption. This simplest problem is the profit inequality problem is suppose you have only one resource to sell uh, in, in there's a single resource and there's a uh, an important result, you know, both uh, uh, in operations and in, uh, economics and computer science about the fact that if you're using a static threshold policy on the rewards, you can achieve half competitiveness, which means you can achieve half of the offline optimum, looking at the whole sequence of rewards. Uh, and that's a very appealing and property and a very important uh, result, especially that it's tight and it can be extended beyond single resource. So you can think about matching, you can think about Metroid constraints. So you can make this problem much, much richer and get a similar um, performance uh, ratio. And I'm citing here some of the work that has looked at this recently. Now, if you want to beat one half competitiveness, that's actually feasible, but you need to introduce um, a slightly simpler problem. So you can, for example, assume that demand is IID, that the, the demand is stationary, or that you have large inventory, and in that case, you can improve beyond one half, get better competitive ratios, but you can also uh, get near optimality results. So as, as the inventory grows, for example, it is known you can uh, converge like to the hindsight optimal at a rate of one over square root K, where K is the inventory. And even there's a perhaps more striking line of literature uh, in, in the recent years, and some of which has been presented in this venue, which is uniform regret algorithm. So this means that uh, as we grow in time, we might the, the number of mistakes that we're doing against the hindsight optimal can actually be uniform, not, not even scaling with time. So that's a very, very strong um, form of, of optimality. Uh, but again, we need for that to happen, we need actually much stronger, uh, much stronger uh, properties. So it's hard kind of to, to say that the whole literature is built on, on, on one idea, but there's a, like a fundamental tool that guides this literature and against which these results have been uh, determined, which is uh, fluid relaxation. So what these fluid relaxations are doing is basically solving for some certainty equivalent version of the problem. So I'm thinking about maximizing rewards subject to a constraint on capacity. And re regarding the, the demand side, I'm replacing the demand, the stochastic demand by deterministic, uh, uh, the deterministic quantity, the average, the mean. Um, and it turns out that this relaxation you know, gives us an upper bound and we can compete against this upper bound with policies, with simple policies. This is how we get the half competitiveness. This is also how we get low regret under uh, more further assumptions. So this is like really the fundamental. And it kind of makes sense that in a regime where variance is small against the mean, what we have is some form of concentration. And that concentration explains that um, we are able to compete against the fluid relaxation where uh, we have a deterministic version of the problem. But now the question is like, in some sense, are we kind of overfitting to this assumption that variance is lower than mean? Is this an unreasonably optimistic assumption? I think it's fair to say that for service systems, there's been quite a bit of work around uh, the adequacy of the, the Poisson model and whether this type of assumption holds. Perhaps this is less the, the case for, um, I would say, platform and matching settings. So um, this assumption can be violated in many settings. And in fact, for example, we looked at some data uh, representing um, uh, inventory uh, of JD.com for a product category. So this is a retail setting. This was public data on the Emson data challenge was published a couple of years ago. And we just asked this basic question. If we look at demand and we find uh, we use a kind of a reasonable aggregation level, is the variance smaller than the mean? Is this uh, connection true for some of the products, uh, for a small fraction, for a large fraction? Uh, so we looked at actually um, 
the largest, so we have one month of data with I think about a million transactions, but then we look at the most frequent products because perhaps those are the, the most reasonable to, to consider for this type of analysis. Um, otherwise we may have no, no sales at all. And we look at um, uh, look different locations as well. So location, granularity being the closest distribution center uh, from the consumer request. So the, the type of a consumer would be a consumer uh, SKU, so the, the, the product that they're ordering and the location. And we then we aggregate the data, the demand data at weekly level, which uh, weekly level is because of the replenishment window is a week. Uh, so I'm showing you what we find. So this is uh, kind of a visual uh, of the mean demand on the x-axis and on the y-axis, the log of variance over mean, uh, estimated variance, estimated mean, unbiased with unbiased estimates in both cases. Uh, and what we find is that actually strikingly 80% of the, the consumer types, the SKUs and locations, are in fact um, violating the assumption that um, variance is lower than mean. And with this, using this uh, model, we're actually explaining a 70% uh, 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 of uh, the, the variation in demand, just looking at the sample mean over one month. So. Uh, quite, I think, an interesting, intriguing uh, kind of realization that even if we know in advance the exact mean of demand uh, across a month for that product, the variation we have from week to week is actually amounting already uh, to more than, than the mean in terms of variance. And that's for 80% of, of, of the product. So actually a dominant fraction of products. Um, and um, yeah, Quan, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. So quick question. Um, can you give some intuition as far as why comparing the variance to the mean instead of the standard deviation to the mean uh, is the right measure? Because I guess if you do standard deviation here, you will get something like minus log two, which will yes. help a little bit, right? Everything below like one point something will, will go to negative. So yeah, so sometimes we didn't want to bias the question. So we started with this, you know, Variance below mean for Poisson, and um, in some sense, which implies that you know the, the standard deviation will be order square root of of, of the mean at most, uh, and we just directly applied it here. Um, uh, so below, you know, and then here the y-axis, you know, being below the y-axis means that we're satisfying that relationship, and above the y-axis, we are violating the assumption. Um, so that's because that was the assumption we wanted to test. Um, under the null hypothesis, you know, on synthetic data, we checked that uh, the, what, the number of points you should see above should be in the order of 37%. So this, this, this test, statistical test, is actually scale invariant. And if the demand was truly Poisson and the regime that has been considered in the literature was correct, the number of skew locations that which should be above should be 37% under the null hypothesis. So it was just a very visual way of, of conveying our point that the assumption is, is is broken or doesn't hold on this data set. Um, and we've done a bunch of robustness checks. So because in practice, maybe there is temporal variation as well. So like we could assume that the demand from week to week might vary. So we could have a fixed effect, a calendar fixed effect for every week. So maybe, you know, there is a calendar promotion season, something like that. Even if you add those factors or maybe you control prices and you know the exact price that the consumers will be facing because you have a promotion schedule. So even controlling for these effects, we still see that variance around your prediction will be high and actually higher than the mean. So the, the number of SKUs, in fact, that violate the assumption is higher than in the previous plot. Uh, we also tested different levels of aggregation. So if you assume that the platform is not replenishing inventory every week, but every three days, uh, this is still true. And then why is it that we have high variance it is because if you look at the data on a finer level, there is autocorrelation. The, the type of models that would fit this data well are ARIMA type models, so that there is autocorrelation. So if there is more demand, this is going to be just more demand. And this explains why the profile of the de of, that we have of, of the total the aggregate demand, you know, violates the assumption. So that's the underlying mechanism for uh, this result. Okay, so I, I, I guess my question. Yeah. yeah, so I guess my question, I understand the, the rationale, like, I think I buy that almost no data in the real world and this type of stuff is Poisson. But like, I guess my question will be, 
I, I, I completely understand that this probably shows that Poisson is not a great assumption, but is, is there some fundamental sense in which the crossing the threshold here has some is important? Kind of like, is it important for your theory, right? Could, could it be possible yes. that, you know, it's yes. not so it's that because important of your theory, even if it's uh, not Poisson? Uh, so I'll address that uh, in a second in terms from a decision-making perspective. What does it mean? So I'll address that with the toy example. But I guess like what you have here is concentration, right? Like you will have that if variance is lower than the mean uh, as the for a scalable market, right? Like you will have concentration property. So what, what this whole research is about is when you don't have concentration. Because if you think about the fluid LP and why it works well in the settings that I mentioned here is because there's some form of concentration. So if you think about the uniform regret algorithms that have been developed, uh, they're doing some form of resolving heuristics and uh, solving a certainty equivalent version of the problem. And this will work fine, will be great as long as there is concentration. But if we don't have concentration, which you know at least on some of the skews here, it's like an order of magnitude, the variance is an order of magnitude higher than the mean, then we cannot rely on that tool anymore. So theoretically, we'll have to think differently, okay? And, but as you pointed, you know, this is not a new fact. I mean, if you think about somehow how uh, in operations, we think about um, uh, demand, modeling demand, usually we have, we think about the mean, but we need to think also about uh, the, the variability. Um, and, the, and what we're pointing to is that there is a disconnect. There's a disconnect between the type of model that people solve and formulate like news vendor in which you have a single period and the type of model that people use for online decision-making in the sense of making real-time updated decisions. Uh, those models are usually subject to that constraint I showed earlier. So let me have a toy example of why this actually matters from a decision-making uh, perspective. So this is a very simple toy model. So before I build any theory, I want to just get a sense of, rough sense of why, why, why would we need to think beyond the fluid relaxation? And I'd, I'd like to argue that what's missing is a form of news vendor trade-off. So there's a nice interpretation for what's missing um, in formulating a fluid. So let's think about this example. We have uh, one type of, of resource and we have two types of demand, two types of consumers. So there's high type and low type. So high type has a higher revenue, RH, and low type has a low revenue uh, of one. And let's suppose I'm cooking up this demand so that basically the demand for the low type is K over two and the demand for the high type is either zero or K with equal probability one half. And uh, I'm gonna further assume that low type customers come in before um, the high type. So I'm making my decisions for the low types and then I will see the realization of the demand for the high type. Uh, so what I'm modeling here is some form of intra-type correlation. So this, the fact that the high, the high demand is either zero or K means that there is correlation in the demand for uh, the high type. So either the product is very hot and there's a lot of cake people coming or there is zero. So this is typically non-poisson. So what is what does fluid look 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 like? So fluid actually doesn't see any any issue here, obviously, because the in expectation we have k units and the expectation of total demand is k. So there is no point in rejecting early on any of the demand. So you would just always accept any incoming demand. And uh, from a fluid perspective, that's not an issue. This is not an issue. Now, obviously, that's not going to be okay, or not, that's not the optimal policy. The optimal policy here is solving a news vendor trade-off. So it might forego some of the early low type customers because there's a high type customers. You wanna save capacity for the high type customer. And this depends on what is the overage and underage cost. So it depends on uh, the rewards that we can get from the high type versus the low type. So there's some critical threshold above which we will stop accepting the low types and only reserve the capacity for the high type. So you know, basically what we're missing out is potentially this sort of news vendor-like um, uh, trade-off that there is some uncertainty that we'll realize in the future. And as a result, we might want to hold on uh, to some of our capacity more aggressively than what Fluid prescribes. So there's another form of failure I'm not gonna elaborate on, which is the adaptivity. Uh, so if there is correlation in the demand, I may want to wait, I'll just give the insight, I may want to wait for later because I will learn, I will be able to learn more precisely what is the realization of my demand because the demand is correlated. Uh, and that's another thing that fluid will not uh, pass through. So this is what I call the elephant in the room in the sense that there's some very basic, uh, this is Dali's uh, uh, kind of take on an elephant in a room uh, in front of Matt. Uh, so uh, this is to say, okay, this is actually a surprisingly simple issue, but one uh, you know that uh, is not 
properly handled within the, the, the model that we're dealing with. So the fact that the news vendor uh, trade-off is not captured was actually something we found uh, kind of noteworthy. So I'll talk about what is the framework that we adopt and then the results. So the idea is actually a very simple idea. So the idea is that the focus of the literature has been on modeling an arrival process. So on modeling um, what happens at time t, uh, conditional on some history, but really the conditioning here uh, disappears because we assume serial independence. Um, typically we assume that there is some independence and that's much needed property for tractability purposes. Um, so what is our idea? So our idea, our idea is to actually completely forget about the arrival process. So not to try explicitly to model an arrival process. What I mean by this is that really the arrival process, kind of what matters the most out of the arrival process is this sort of longitudinal aggregate demand data. How many customers show up of each type? This is actually the critical quantity that uh, if you think about hindsight optimality, the hindsight optimum does not depend on your arrival process. It only depends on how many consumers show up of different types. So, so first of all, like if you think about the standard benchmark that people want to compare to in this literature, it does not depend on what is the sequence of arrivals. What it depends on is what is the realization of the aggregate demand. So our idea is to say, okay, let's try to model directly the aggregate demand. And in fact, regarding the uh, arrival process, let's make some stylized assumptions that come from, from computer science literature. So you can think of two extremes. One is that maybe uh, there's going to be the worst case permutation so that you don't control the arrival ranking. So the ranking will be uh, chosen by an adversary to which you want to be robust. But that's a way, convenient way not to model that arrival process because as long as you model the demand vector and the distribution of demand vector, then uh, you're in good hands. Or maybe you can think that you know this adversarial assumption is too strong, so you can think of a uniformly at random arrival process. And our results basically kind of map to all these cases that I've described. So we have now results for uh, these two types of, of assumptions. But really what I want you to take away is let's not model an arrival process. Let's instead think, try to think about what is the aggregate demand. And I think like this is there's convenience in, in many ways from, from this because when you think about what is more convenient to estimate, usually demand, you know, as a single shot count quantity, aggregate quantity might be easier to estimate than kind of specifying an explicit uh, process. Um, and um, and also uh, 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 in terms of uh, the data that we have, usually the data we have is aggregate. So it might be if if this framework works out, like we can get reasonable policies uh, and we can generalize existing results, then you know there is an appeal from the simplicity, the mere simplicity of the formulation of the problem that we don't try to formulate uh, uh, the, the arrival process. Now, we call it non-parametric for that reason. And uh, you know, I'll give examples of you know, parametric uh, uh, results that we can uh, handle now that uh, you know, are special cases of our model that were not known before. Um, but you know, let me just highlight that um, um, at this stage that if the demand is arbitrary, the distribution of the demand, so if the demand model, which is a distribution of the demand vectors is arbitrary, then actually this problem is very hard. This, this problem is as general as it can get. So there's nothing to hold, right? Because actually by von Neumann's uh, theorem, by duality, assuming a demand, a dis, like, assuming that one knows the distribution of the demand is the same thing as not knowing anything. Uh, so um, in some sense, we, 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 if we don't have some assumption, we cannot proceed further. Uh, because we will get arbitrarily bad uh, performance guarantees. So even the, the knowledge of the demand, the distribution of demand is not a sufficient uh, modeling assumption if you want to get any form of uh, uh, provable guarantee. So what kind of assumptions can we inject? So let's go back and we'll have two models in the framework that we are able to, for which we're able to uh, obtain uh, optimal tractability results. But let me start with the first one. And so these two types of model will model, will represent different forms of correlations. So the first one is in-depth. We we'll call it in-depth because what we'll assume is we will relax the serial independence. So there is no independence over time. There can be correlations, but we assume that there is independence across types. That the different types of demand will be uh, independent. So the, the demand, the DJ, which is the number of customers of type J will be independent mutually. Um, so what we are representing here is intra-type correlation, but across types, 
is independent. So, so here is the sampling process for this model. Suppose that there is a distribution, a marginal distribution that is arbitrary for each type of customer that we can fit from data, so it's known. So there is an arbitrary marginal distribution for each type of customer, DJ. So we sample uh, independently across types, all the DJs. So this realizes the demand. Uh, and then the arrival uh, of the consumers, what is this, this, the sequence by which they arrive, we can assume either an adversary chooses that order or like a uniform yet random based on the frame. Okay, so that's the in-depth model. And this model is actually already a strict generalization of Poisson because this independence that I'm highlighting here was already by the split and combined property of Poisson, this is already ind independent. We already have independence in the base model. So we're strictly generalizing the Poisson model in a way that preserves the independence across times. So to give some intuition, you can think of, for example, if you're thinking about a spatial market, so you have the demand here, DJ is how many customers show up in different locations, so, and you have different regions, you can assume that these different regions might be fairly disconnected from one another, and as a result, independent. So that's kind of the uh, motivation. And this allows us to actually generalize Poisson in many, I think, meaningful ways. So one is we can think of mixture of Poisson. So imagine that there is a Poisson model, but the rate of arrivals is something that we can estimate from data, but not exactly pin down what the rate is. There's a mixture. So there's a distribution of put that over different potential rates of arrival. So that's an example that we might be interested in. Another case would be like say self-exciting processes, like say an Hawks process. So this is a type of, of processes that hasn't been studied in previous literature uh, that we can accommodate in this framework. So as long as uh, this types of processes govern each type of customer, we are able to handle that. Another example would be, um, so, so basically the Hawks process would be representing bursts of arrival. So no, long tail distributions for the demand. And then really we can, we can have any adapted process any prediction-based uncertainty. So suppose you have access to a simulation oracle. Suppose you have some machine learning algorithm that can give you access to predictions for demand realization. So then that would be fitting in our framework because I, again, the only thing we need is access to some uh, distribution. And in fact, uh, we, in the results will show that we only need to have access to sample. So this framework is actually easy to estimate because now, we can just estimate the distribution from the samples of the different, uh, the marginal distribution of different types. So, but the key question is, can we get tractable matching policy? So what does it imply from a technical perspective? Um, so I'd like to highlight that there's another model we, 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 we study, which is actually covering the other form of correlation you can imagine, which is intertype correlation, like a common factor. Maybe, uh, I don't know, there is a, a holiday, maybe for the pumpkin example, we, we're close to, Halloween, so you're going to have all your demand come in, uh, and everyone from every region will, will, will order pumpkins. So the process here would be looking at like as follows. What we will have is uh, first we will sample the total demand, the total number of customers that come in, that's D, and that again can be any, any arbitrary distribution. So we're not placing any limit on uh, the type of distribution, uh, and, and that's the reason why this model is also non-parametric. But then uh, let's assume that um, the, the type that realize will be independently uh, sampled, uh, conditional on the length of the sequence from some known uh, uh, probability vector, uh, Bt. Uh, so that would be uh, basically there are proportions of types uh, that I can forecast. I don't know the total demand uh, that will uh, come in, but I can say predict what will be the proportion of marginal customers coming to, to me. So that would be the sampling of, of this process. So we have results for both types of models um, and I'll actually delve now into uh, the algorithms part. So the first observation is that we need new benchmarks. We cannot compare to the fluid LP and that should not be surprising because now we have processes where the variance is much higher than the mean. So looking in the standard deviation, you know, it's not an order smaller than the mean. So looking only at expectation of demand would not convey enough information. So the fluid benchmark is unrealistic. Uh, and that pro we prove basically that the gap of performance between any algorithm and the fluid can be unbounded, including the offline optimum. And, and we also show that this cannot be easily fixed. So you cannot just take the fluid, add a few constraints. So we need to reshuffle the benchmark. 
So here is the one of the key ideas in the paper. Um, so this is the fluid uh, benchmark that I'm writing here. What we need is to make this fluid relaxation actually more realistic and account for the fact that the demand might come in in bursts. We, we have to think of all these correlated arrivals essentially, because this sort of correlations will um, uh, hurt basically my ability to serve demand. Uh, so the idea is, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm focusing here on the in-depth model, the first model I've shown you. So I'm placing it myself in the condition where uh, the demand follows and ar has arbitrary marginals, and I know the distribution, but uh, there's independence across times. So here, we, what our first tool is actually to think of a different LP. So let me pass to this LP. I'm showing you here the LP. So you can see that the objective doesn't change. It's still maximizing rewards. I still have a constraint on the, 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 the resources, like the inventory of, of, of each uh, uh, product. But now I've changed, as you can imagine, I've changed my constraints on the demand side. And specifically, let, I have now uh, a constraint for every type of consumer, every demand type, and for every subset of resources. So what is this constraint saying? This constraint is saying that essentially it's a whole marriage condition on a serving demand and then taking the expectation. So for every subset of resources, the cardinality of the matching, if you think from a particular on any particular sample, is upper bounded by the minimum between the capacity, uh, the sum of, 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 of inventories and the demand uh, and taking then the expectation. So this is what this constraint is expressing. It's, uh, whole marriage condition, which should hold on every sample path. So you can get this constraint from any sample path. It's actually a fairly simple idea. So of the problem here is that we have a lot of constraints, right? We have put in, uh, exponentially con many constraints because we have many, many subsets, but this is not actually a real problem. Um, so not only this is a valid benchmark that any uh, policy will satisfy, but in fact, we can solve this problem, this LP in polynomial time efficiently because these are polymetric constraints. So actually, Computationally, it's not actually an extra, um, uh, not so much of an extra uh, burden uh, to solve this LP, it's actually tractable. So we can solve the LP, we can get uh, uh, some fractional flow from, from this LP. And obviously this fractional flow now will be smaller than the one we get from fluid because there are more constraints. So we've tightened our uh, benchmark, we've made it more realistic. So. If you don't like LPs, or if uh, like in some ways, uh, conceptually, this idea of solving uh, exponentially many constraints in an LP, there's actually a very simple policy that you can use that doesn't even require solving this LP, which is to do Monte Carlo simulation. So you, you can essentially sample a bunch of realizations of the demand from, for example, you can just have access to samples from your data. For each sample, you solve a matching, and then you take the average. So with this Monte Carlo simulation, everything I'll, I'll describe later will still hold. So you can algorithmically, there's no point in solving this LP, uh, but we get better performance, a slightly better interpretation of the performance guarantee under, under solving the LP, because that will be the benchmark. So this is uh, basically the first step of the idea of the algorithm. And the main result is that actually we can get a half competitive matching policy against this LP that uh, is computed in polynomial time and it holds even under adversarial arrivals. So even if you don't control the permutation. So why is this, mean, and that's kind of the main theorem that I'll go through. And why is this meaningful? Well, this is meaningful because first of all, half was the best you could get if you remember my first slide on the literature on profit inequality. So there's this, we know already that um, under adversarial arrivals, we cannot do better than one half competitiveness. So strictly we've generalized the class of models we can handle but we didn't sacrifice anything in terms of performance guarantee. So we still get the same uh, competitive ratio, which is the ratio between our policy and the offline. Um, so that's the, that's a nice result because that tells you that this uh, is more general, but uh, with the same guarantee. But we, we're, together with Wei Zhongzhang at, at Tepper, uh, we proved uh, recently that actually we cannot improve on this one half competitiveness, even under large inventory and uniform arrivals. So that's actually a very, uh, that's the difference with Poisson system, which is that even if you have a scaling of inventory, even if you assume that the arrivals are uniform, which means that uniformly at random be sampled, so that's the difference between adversarial permutation and uniformly at random, actually this one half is optimal. So the, the, I guess the takeaway is that the performance band we will get will be uh, 
optimal comp uh, worst case guarantee that we can hope to achieve. So an immediate byproduct is now for mixture of Poisson, for hoax processes, for adaptive processes in which there was no result in the literature, now we can get half competitiveness. And this is answering the question of like, can we get tractable matching policies? It turns out that we can even under this generalization. So let me guide you through some of the key ideas and actually quite simple, um, but the analysis is quite intricate. So the policy space is not gonna become too complicated. And in fact, we will still have static price thresholds. So the policy will still, for every resource is gonna be associated some price threshold uh, that is static, that is not changing during the horizon. And basically our matching decisions will be guided by these static price thresholds in the sense that we will never make an assignment of a consumer to a particular resource where the reward is lower than that price threshold. So that's a cutoff, that's a safeguard that you're not exhausting your resources too quickly because you're reserving them for the valuable uh, high reward, um, juicy rewards basically. But now if the prices are static, something has to be dynamic because we have correlations and uh, uh, we have to adapt to the variance. And that's the fundamental distinction with the, the fluid system where by concentration, we can approach the fluid. So here, there needs to be some adaptivity. And here is an example. So suppose I have consumers blue, one, two, five. Uh, so the, the number here represents the ordering of arrival. So the problem is now if I'm, I have consumer one and two showing up and I assign them both to the top uh, resource that's worth $2, then I'm going to miss out on potentially a consumer three that arrives. That, that has a higher reward for the same resource. So the thickness of the line represents the, the reward. So what this is telling you is basically that we need to be able to pace ourselves, uh, that there can be bursts of demand and we need to be able to per pace ourselves. So how do we do that? Well, what we will use, as you can imagine, is the LP solution, the XIJ star. So I get that fractional matching. I wanna use that fractional matching to guide my decisions. So the key question is how do I pace myself uh, against bursts of demand. And technically, this is a rounding uh, type algorithm that I want to employ. So I want to make sure that as demand realizes, without knowing future demand, I'm able to mimic this XIJ star fractions in an online fashion without loss. Is that even feasible? And that completes the algorithm. The algorithm is um, using an online rounding uh, subroutine, which is routing uh, incoming demand to resources in combination with price threshold. So the algorithm is fairly simple to implement. So this is the central property of the paper technically. So remember this LP and remember how we added a bunch of constraints to make the LP more realistic. Well, with this more realistic LP, we now have something that is quite interesting, which is that we there exists a lossless rounding of the LP. So what this means is that as consumers come in, I'll be able to route these consumers to the resources in a way that exactly mimics the, the fractional um, entry of my vector xij star. So any vector in the polytope, I can equally match in proportion, uh, you know, in an online fashion. So this is what is represented by this uh, lemma, which is the main technical result of the paper, uh, which tells you that there is a distribution over routing, so that's pi, for every consumer type. So that uh, the sum here is like the expected number of times that uh, a consumer of type J is being uh, routed to resource I, that is exactly equal to XIJ star. So in other words, this LP is without loss in terms of mimicking the marginals, not in terms of mimicking the whole distribution of matches. So that's something I'll come back to later. But in terms of just mimicking the XIJ star vector, I can do that in an online fashion without loss. So this is telling you also something else. It's telling you that this LP with the added constraints is has become so realistic that actually there is no loss now in trying to convert it to a, a feasible uh, kind of routing decision. Uh, but there could, again, the there's still a loss somewhere, of course, because even if I get these uh, marginal uh, rates of matching, uh, there is still potentially correlations across types that could lead to a loss. This is why we get the half competitive guarantee, okay? But at least in expectation, looking only at the marginals, we can mimic this. So what is the idea? And the rounding is actually quite distinct from, I would say, standard roundings in this literature. 
Because usually how you round the consumer demand is like by being myopic, by proportionally, um, basically trying to proportionally uh, uh, route the demand, to the, the demand to the resources according to the vector. So let's suppose that my matching vector is xj star that I'm showing here. Uh, and suppose that these are the, the different entries. So the way you read this is that suppose I solve that benchmark, that LP benchmark, which is a tightening of the of the um, fluid. And suppose that you know it tells you resource one should be matched with fraction one eighth, resource two uh, with fraction three eighths, resource three with fraction seven eighth plus epsilon one fourth uh, zero. Okay, so this is this is the rate at which I'm matching type J consumers to my different uh, 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 resources. Now, I'm, what I'm showing is an example where basically suppose that for the demand for type J, um, the probability that you have more than L arrivals is the decay, decaying at rate one half. So it's one, one, one over two power L. Okay. So um, the probability of having one arrival is one. The probability of having two arrivals will be uh, one half, three arrival, one eighth, one fourth, so on and so forth. So the question is can we uh, get exactly this uh, vector x j star in an online fashion as demand comes in by routing uh, the consumers to the resources. So the, the idea, the basic idea usually is to use proportionality. So for example, you can ask which customer should we route to resource one? Well, resource one should be matched one eighth fraction of the time. So maybe uh, when the first consumer L equal one arrives, I should basically uh, greedily or uh, toss a coin and with fraction one eighth of the time match that customer to the resource. That would exactly mimic one, the one eighth ratio for from the first consumer. But it's not very hard to see that this is actually not a good idea because this will be a blocking probability that's gonna be blocking future uh, routings um, in a way that I cannot actually achieve the vector xijs there. So why, how to see that? Realize that the third consumer here has a fraction of matching seven eight plus epsilon. So actually, if I, if my first consumer is matched of type J is matched to the resource uh, to resource one one eighth of the time, then it means that I can never match any other resource more than seven eighth of the time because that's the residual probability. So I will never be able to get the seven eight plus epsilon. So I cannot be myopic. So the key idea is to construct an actual feasible rounding. And surprisingly, that is possible. Um, turns out that the main I the idea is to pick the latest consumer that can that arrives sufficiently frequently to achieve the desired rate. So instead of matching consumer one, one eighth of the time to the first consumer, it is better to uh, match consumer one to the fourth arrival consumer who arrives exactly with probability one eighth. Um, and then there is actually a recursion that one can formulate where um, by picking always the latest arriving consumer that uh, satisfies the demand. And the type constraints, the, the exponential family of constraints will show that there is an invariant of this recursion that can be maintained. Um, and the key, one of the key ideas is to think about uh, how uh, queries, idle queries should be aggregated to create a, a recursion invariants over time. So I'll, I'm not gonna go into the details, but you can trust me that this is actually feasible. Um, and then because we have a hardness result, this is basically the best possible competitive ratio we can achieve. Um, so uh, we recently, uh, with Wei Zhong Zheng, um, uncovered what type of instances would uh, prove that we cannot beat one half, even uh, if the demand is uniformly arriving. Uh, so this is, if you're curious, this is the hard instance. Um, so suppose you have uh, one, um, uh, basically two types of consumers, one that has high reward, one that has small reward, and that um, the demand for the small reward is Bernoulli with rate epsilon and the reward is one over epsilon. So that in expectation, um, the probability of arrival multiplied by the reward is one. So it's like kind of almost indifferent with the first resource. And for the first resource, let's assume that the demand um, arrives, the, the, the pr pr probability of demand being K is one over K. So it turns out that this distribution is the worst distribution because uh, as time passes, there is no information you gain about the total demand. So this, uh, it's making, it's confusing you. So that's the distribution so that there is no information uh, from the correlation across time. So you cannot learn basically better how to separate customer one from customer two based on the information you have uh, obtained so far. Anyway, so I'll 
just uh, mention that for the other model, we also get competitive ratio of one half and even uh, a competitive ratio that is dependent on the, the inventory and it improves with inventory. Um, and the idea is also based on a, 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 a linear programming, a different linear programming benchmark. So to conclude, I think like the main ideas I want to take away is that uh, fluid is, is a, a reasonable assumption in some cases, but might not be in many others. And this means that many policies, like certainty equivalent policies, but also re-optimization heuristics will fail as long as they're using the fluid relaxation. That's something I didn't mention, but the toy example I constructed initially, you don't fix that by doing re-optimization. So as more information comes online, you're not going to get a better performance. So the framework combines basically the idea of not modeling an arrival process, but modeling directly the aggregate demand and making a stylized assumption on, on uh, uh, the arrivals, because actually the arrivals matter a bit less in terms of performance. And then the key ideas also are based on you changing the frame, the, the benchmark instead of LP tightening, instead of, sorry, fluid LP, we use a different form of LP. And there's more information in that LP. As a result, we are able to develop a lossless rounding scheme uh, for the in-depth model. And what we like about the framework is that it's non-parametric, tractable, surprisingly at least, and data-driven. Uh, and I'm concluding here with some uh, open questions. Uh, we're still thinking, how can we do better than one half competitiveness for the in-depth model? Um, I presented two models today, but actually maybe there is a unifying framework uh, that combines the results that we have for two models. Uh, the fact that the model is non-parametric raises question around sample complexity for estimation. Uh, and I think the real two kind of important questions here are, how do we really relate the quantity of uncertainty to achievable performance? I don't think there's theory around that that is satisfactory. And then uh, I think thinking about algorithms, dual-based algorithms like um, uh, online memory descent and uh, 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 PID controllers, I think is would be very uh, important because uh, these are algorithms commonly used by practitioners. All right, and thank you all for your attention. And I was delighted to present uh, today. All right, thanks so much, Ali. Uh, any questions? I guess you're on. Oh, no, you always clapping. Okay, sorry. <laughs> this the seminar, uh, we're officially over time. Um, so obviously, feel free to sign off. Uh, we'll post the videos online. But um, if you have questions, I guess, Ali, if you have time, can maybe take care. Okay. Um, I I have a I actually have a lot of questions. <laughs> if, uh, if I may ask some, uh, of course. One, yeah. uh, one is um, first of all, very nice work. Uh, I think we we talked about this a little bit in private, right? This idea that sort of fluid is not a good uh, demonstration if you have uncertainty. Uh, I'm trying to square this up with uh, first of all, is, is there a natural like a continuous time version of this? Um, because. I'm I'm just thinking I've deployed similar systems uh, at Shift and in other companies, where the supply is sort of is kind of like ongoing, right? Let's say you have gig workers and stuff, but I think that's a that's a different application than a finite inventory because here the depletion of inventory seems to matter a lot um, yeah. in the nuance because if you have a lot of inventory, then fluid is really not that bad. It's really uh, on this idea that your inventory is so small that like one. A uh, not so careful move will wipe out like half of your inventory. Um, is that right? Is is this like an intrinsic kind of like a finite horizon problem? This is a great question. So um, yes, I don't think um, right now we have a good understanding of what happens. So th in this literature, there's like what people call dynamic matching, which means basically that both resources, supplies, and demand come in online. That's, That's right. So you don't control. Uh, so it's here more like a queuing setting then in that case, right? Exactly. It's like I that's see. a natural extension. So because the, one of the uh, first papers I've, I've, I've worked on in this area was actually thinking about that type of queuing problems. Uh, and, it, and it turns out that you can still use uh, similar types of ideas with the fluid relaxation. But that was, again, a Poisson-based arrival process. So the question you're asking is, like, can we extend this to have two-sided uncertainty and, um, and still be able to conduct this sort of analysis? Uh, and I don't have, I don't know. Uh, but I so 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 is it fair to say yeah. like basically as soon as you have a lot of situation where demand can wipe out the entire existing supply and hit zero, yeah. then yeah. sort of fluid is no longer a great um, model. That's, is that fair to say? Like 
this is fair to say, and I think maybe service platforms like the ones you described, uh, matching platforms, they also have this type of properties because inventory is like basically density of you know workers in a certain uh, you know network, and then the question right. is like you know that density is never going to be very high. So if you have a burst of demand, you're going to wipe your inventory. So I think it's a, it's something that we don't handle, but we we it's an extension to consider. Yeah, that's got it. Uh, and my, my hope is that this sort of LP like finer LP might, might also be applicable there. Um, uh, yeah. I, I think LP, with... I mean, I think it's very useful in practice, by the way, like um, it, it, it does pretty well, to be honest. Uh, although it depends on what you define as LP, because sometimes I think in practice, people just solve a fairly greedy LP. It's not even about inventory, right? It's, it's really just about solving at the current time step. What would you do? Like which people would you match uh, to what yeah. kind of jobs? Um, yeah, so our LP is like forward looking, so it has a future demand and current demand. I think in order fulfillment, that's a reasonable uh, type of assumption. Um, I think, um, yeah, I don't know about service platforms and the extent to which they're doing that. I mean, they're trying to do that to some extent. So um, I don't think that computationally it brings it too much complexity. So a related question, if I may, is I, I think in practice, if I'm not mistaken, I'm less familiar with this kind of like inventory version, but but, but seems like uh, there's an analog in like renewable energy when you have dispatchable storage, right? So the, the the sensible thing that you probably do if you have to do it is to do some kind of model predictive control, which would mean you just constantly update your prediction about the future and you constantly solve yeah. the, the Oracle LP and then you just deploy whatever Oracle LP tells you to do right now um in in like a battery so, it's literally an lp because yeah. you know you just uh, write write out your dynamics do you have any uh guesses on yeah, yeah. would that, yeah, would I guess that be take... related to what you do or is a better version yeah. like you no know, i i think actually this resolving heuristic is not going to work uh the sort of re-optimization uh is not going to work if you still use fluid so I think what you could do is like actually use this Titan LP, so LP with more constraints in a similar fashion and resolve, you know, uh, in every period based on, on future demand. Uh, and I think that would handle uh, the type of uncertainty we're talking about. So there's another algorithmic, actually the, maybe one, one other type of policies that I would like to advocate that I think makes sense, which would be simulation-based. So, so what, I, what do I mean by simulation-based? I just mean, or sample-based. What I mean is simply that you sample uh, realizations of the future right. and then solve the matching and right. do that a few, you know, for very- yeah, Actually, that's what I mean, right? Typically when people do like Monte Carlo tree search is uh, you, you don't just do the fluid uh, solving, uh, but, but you're right, the, the fluid version wouldn't work. You basically need to do a DP essentially. Yes, but instead of the D, that's a simple, like that's an in-between in some sense. That's, right, that's right, an right. in-between. It's the like DP. a sample approximation of the DP. So you, yes, I see. Yeah, that makes more what, sense. We got, basically, we give theoretical ground for that type of policy. Uh, that's how I think about. Uh, oh, you do. You think your policy does speak to that? Yes, that's exactly what the policy does for the matching problem, not for the maybe different type of allocation, but for the matching problem, um, you could either solve an LP or you could do exactly what you described of sam taking samples and then on every sample you solve a, a matching problem and then you average out the solutions so that's what your current uh half optimal uh policy yeah. does oh okay okay i, I wasn't following or so well. there are two policies yeah it either does that or it does uh the lp that i described and then the price threshold got it got it very cool all right i guess that's all i have cool. merge thanks man. do you have questions or <laughs> I guess we're we're out of time. All right, thanks a lot. Thanks for a great talk. Thanks. We'll post this online. So, thanks a lot for the invite. Take care.